Hey everyone, this is Ryan, and let's continue talking about evidence-based dentistry as much as we don't want to, um, and we'll talk about treatment efficacy or effectiveness. So treatment efficacy has three primary studies associated with it. Randomized controlled clinical trials, or RCTs, are one of the best study methods available, and they look at treatment effect primarily. How effective is this treatment? And then we also have non-randomized clinical trials, which are useful in certain scenarios. We'll talk about them next video. And systematic reviews are the best because they gather together a bunch of data from a bunch of different sources. So RCTs take random samples of, dis of diseased and diagnosed population. So this is different from any of the other study designs that we've seen so far because we were either looking at um, the entire population, we were either looking at um, specifically people who were healthy or and at risk, or people who were exposed or unexposed to a certain uh, risk predictor. But this is the first and only test uh, study method or study design where we'll be looking at primarily only diseased people. And then we take these um, diseased people and, and assign them to two groups, a treatment group and a control group that are either exposed or unexposed um, to, to treatment in this case. Or we can take random samples of healthy at-risk population like we did with prospective cohort studies um, to test a preventative treatment because we want to see um, if they don't get disease. They have a, a low incidence of disease, for example, if the treatment is really effective. So randomization leads to groups, theoretically, that are equivalent in risk factors and all other traits prior to intervention. So this, this is part of the reason why it's such a strong method, is that uh, we get two groups that should be equal in all other regards except for if they get treatment or if they get a control placebo. Blinding also strengthens evidence and we know we can do single blinding for the patient, double blinding for the patient and doctor, or triple blinding for the patient, doctor, and investigator or statistician. SEP stands for surrogate endpoint. Uh, surrogate just means a substitute or in this case, we're taking a substitute measurement um, of, of a specific treatment that may or may not correlate with a real clinical endpoint. So what does this mean? Well, in the, in the context of a study, um, we usually will stop the study before we get to some um, clinical endpoint. So say getting caries is our clinical endpoint. Well, if we're measuring the effect of, of fluoride toothpaste on the prevention of caries, maybe instead of waiting to get caries or not, we'll say, what's the fluoride content of our plaque? And that will that should predict what the actual clinical endpoint is going to be. Um, but it doesn't always do that. Um, so the problem with SCP is that it can give a false alarm or a false hope because we never got to that um, that clinical endpoint. But it saves money and it avoids ethical problems. So RCTs measure treatment effect and they do this by um, subtracting or dividing um, the values from the control relative to the treatment. And we don't need to know how to calculate this. Um, it'll just be reported as some number with some confidence interval or some range of possible values. For example, 18 fewer decayed and filled surfaces per 10 people. So that's pretty good. That's a good um, and it's cleaning, clinically meaningful. Um, that's an example of treatment effect. And again, um, instead of calling it sampling variability, we call it statistical significance. And we have the same p-value and 95% confidence interval. And um, we can compare 95% confidence intervals with null values, 
but it depends on how we got the treatment effect. If we took a ratio, we compare it to 1, and if we took a, a net difference or a subtraction, we compare it with 0. Then, if the um, test result happens to be statistically significant, then we can consider whether or not it's clinically significant. And this is considering the clinical value of the treatment to patients and, and the community. Um, and we can measure this um, with NNT, which is just the number of patients needed to treat in order that one patient be cured from disease, or if we're measuring um, a preventative treatment, have the disease prevented. With NNT, one is the best possible treatment. That means you treat one person, and one person is treated. Um, probably not. I probably not the case in most scenarios. Um, but the lower the number, the better. If you're comparing two treatments, so a null result or something greater than point a p greater than point zero five may actually occur for an efficacious or good treatment if the study is underpowered. So underpowered would mean that if the study is sloppy. If there are too few patients in the study, we didn't ask enough people. Or if the patient selection was poor, say we did the consecutive patients, we had some bias there, that would be a, a crappy study, just underpowered. And so also with statistical significance, now we consider power, which is the probability that a study de detects an effect when there is an effect to, de to be detected. And the greater the power, the greater the study, and we use 0 0.80 as a benchmark value. So power is like, can we find something? Can the study find something if it's if it's actually out there? And type two error is the is the opposite of power. Um, it's the probability of getting a null result on a good treatment. So type two error is getting a null result when in fact there was a good treatment, you just had a crappy crappy test and you couldn't figure that out. So you want a low value for this. So this table, I tried to simplify it as much as possible. It's very confusing, but hopefully um, it'll make some sense after I'm done talking about it a little bit. So here in the left column, we have the treatment um, that we, the treatment that we were testing with the RCT, and we were we were trying to figure out is this treatment good? Does it have a good effect in preventing or curing disease, or does it have no effect at all? Is it useless? The top row here, if it's a good treatment effect, that means that the p value is less than 0 0.05, and I don't know if my pen's going to work so good. So we're just going to remember that this row, this top row, the p-value is less than 0 0.05. And that means for the bottom row that the p-value is greater than 0 0.05. We couldn't prove that the um, treatment had a good effect. Now with the other studies, we were uh, we were talking about all the ones that we can, you know, cross-sectional and all that. When the p-value was less than 0 0.05, um, that was the statistically significant result, and that's really all that we were looking at was this top row. And then if we, if we had a type 1 error, uh, we made a mistake in that it was actually, a, um, a, and by bad I mean it had no effect. Um, it was a non-efficacious treatment. That was that error. But now that we're talking about randomized control trials, when we have a no treatment effect or a null result, this is when we talk about power. So when the p-value is greater than 0 0.05 in the case of this bottom row, that means that the study lacked the power necessary to detect whether this treatment was actually any good. So that would be um, this, this box right here, uh, where the p-value is greater than 0 0.05 and the power was less than 
0.80. It was the study was underpowered and we we could not detect whether this treatment was actually any good or not. Um, the bottom right here, we the the treatment was seen as having no effect and it was truly had uh, had no effect. So here we have a p-value of greater than 0.05 because we're in the bottom row, but the power was greater than 0 0.80. It was a good treatment. And then here, of course, the p-value is less than 0 0.05, and we don't have to talk about power in this top row. It's only applicable when we're talking about um, null results. So hopefully that, that makes a little more sense. Um, or maybe it doesn't. Hopefully it does. So when talking about treatment efficacy, this is kind of an interesting um, little diagram thingy here. And so when you're looking at a study design, the observational studies, these are the cross-sectional prospective cohort, they're not useful. They don't help with treatment efficacy. Um, and we'll talk about non-randomized -random in a little bit. But we're talking about here randomized control trials. And you can... Um, test whether or not, or you can see whether or not it's a good quality study with this consort database. And then you can, you, the main question you're asking is, is the treatment efficacious? If it's less than 0.05, it's, if it's in this top row, then we can go on um, to say, to evaluate the clinical significance. Um, if it's greater than 0 0.05, or we're in this bottom row, then we have to talk about the power. Because if the power is less than 0.8 or not reported, I'll go back one more time, then we could have this error, where it was where we got a non-efficacious result when in fact the treatment was good. And we should have been recommending the treatment when we didn't. And if the power is greater than 0.8, then it's good evidence that the treatment sucked and our, our study was good in detecting that result. So real quick, I'll just talk about two modifications to randomized clinical trials. Um, randomized crossover design is, again, randomized sample of a disease population, control and test groups, that's the same. Except this time we have a washout period, so we... Um, do our original assessment, then we wait some time, and then we cross over or swap the groups, the control and test groups, and then um, do the same test. So this time we're kind of uh, using each subject to serve as their own control because they'll be experiencing both the control and test treatments. Um, and this controls for possible baseline differences, which is good. Um, but it's limited because it requires disease, recurring disease, like gingivitis. And then we have split mouth design, um, where again, random sample of a disease population, control and test groups, but this time we randomly assign uh, the control and test to either the right or left side of your mouth, hence split mouth design. And again, this is good because each uh, subject can serve as their own control, and it controls for possible baseline differences, but again, it has limited application because if you're testing periodontal disease, which affects the entire mouth, a treatment would likely circulate to the other half of your mouth. So again, we have some limited applications. So randomized control trials are really good, but they have some problems. Um, subjects who enroll don't typically represent the entire population. This is a problem we have with all um, sample populations because we can't get the entire target population to participate. Limited applications, you couldn't randomly assign communities for water fluoridation, it, or you could, it would be really hard. So that's probably um, not the best application of an RCT. And then there are ethical dilemmas. Um, so some things uh, you just can't do because the control group should at least get a standard, some standard of care. So that's when we step in and we start talking about non-randomized control trials, which I'll go into in the next video. So I hope this video is helpful and we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.